Uh, good morning, I'm Shobhik. I work for Red Hat. I work as an en engineering architect and lead for the Red Hat Developer Group. Uh, my job is to lead teams to ensure that developers are empowered to build tooling and applications without having to worry about things that they shouldn't really be worrying about and should be done for them. For example, uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, we know it's powerful, but it's complex. There is a huge learning curve. Um, if you knew how to use it well, if you had the right tools, you could build really powerful applications with that. Uh, my presentation will be on how you could develop on OpenShift using your VS Code IDE. Um, so we do have this problem often that, hey, this works fine when I ran it in my local, but then I, when I put it in a container and then when I ran it on OpenShift or Kubernetes, it didn't work quite well. So the problem we wanted to solve with containers and Kubernetes and OpenShift came back, which means you still have the problem of some things working locally because you didn't have the right tooling to emulate how a deployed environment would look like. And then, yeah, you, you did have a problem of how do, how do I ensure my code changes can quickly be live on a cluster? Um, a typical method for that would be you write code locally, you do a build a build or a Docker build, and then you create an image, you push it somewhere, and then you go and pull it and run it on your cluster. So for a small code change, you would actually have to do all these steps to be able to see it running live on OpenShift, or Kubernetes for that matter. But then that looks like a solution which nobody would technically use because it's too long. So what they would potentially do is work on a project for three months and throw it over to the, to the DevOps folks to try it out and run it on OpenShift or Kubernetes. So what we do is um, we actually work on multiple ways to take your source code and create a container out of it. Uh, one way is called a source to image, uh, which is effectively we have a nice framework to say, here is my source code. And this is a Node.js source, so we take out the Node.js builder image, and then we smash those two together and we say, here is your application container image that we just created out for you, uh, which, has, which has all the checks and balances in place, and that can be now deployed on your environment. Now, so this framework lets us do versioned images, just like you would do for anything else, like your code. And then what we did is we connected that with VS Code so that you could potentially stay within your VS Code and not have to leave your, the com comfort of your developer tooling to be able to use this. So let's see how it goes. So what we effectively do is, um, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is that you could either run your OpenShift um, somewhere else, which is not on your local, or on Minishift, which is on, on your laptop. Um, you could use a, like a kubectl or an OC command line to talk to it. And then there is another tool on top of it, which we built called OpenShift Do, which abstracts out all the Kubernetes and OpenShift troubles for you, which means to create a normal route, or, or let's say to deploy an Apple application and reach it in OpenShift, you have to effectively do a build of that application. You have to push it somewhere. You have to have a deployment, which needs to use that image and build pods for you. And then you need to create a service, and then you need to create a route out of it. That's really a lot of things for a developer who just wants to get started and get it running. Um, so what, what we did is we built a solution where we said, okay, you're in your VS Code. You just say, push to OpenShift, and we do all that for you. And then you say, hey, get me a URL. We create a service on the route and wire it up with your pod with that. Let's take a look at a demo for that. So the OpenShift connector sits nicely on your VS Code. It's, a, it's an XTX extension you can install for free from the marketplace. Um, it, it detects if you have a cluster you're already connected to. If not, you could connect to it using the general Kubernetes OpenShift ways of connecting to a cluster. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with creating a namespace or a project. Let's say, call it Boston 1. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I need a new application. Now we get the concept of applications and components. An application is effectively, let's say, um, your power circuit management application, which can have tons of services in, inside, inside it, a billing service, a customer grievance service, um, a maintenance service inside it. So, uh, so, so an application is an aggregation of multiple microservices, which together do something, which together solve a business case, I would say. So let's say I'm creating an application inside my project or namespace in Kubernetes. So I'll call this Power Circuit Management. So I can see I have a new application here, but this is just an abstraction, an aggregation. That does, this doesn't necessarily have anything running yet. So what I do is I'll go and say, hey, um, to create a new component there, which means now I'd really like to have a workload associated with it. So I'd say let's go for a Git repository. You could do, do this from multiple ways, but I'll start with a Git repository. And I'll say I have a Node.js application which is on my version control, and I'd like to deploy that. And it'll quickly ask me, okay, which branch do you really need to deploy? And I said, master, and then I'll come up with a nice name. So let's say this is the billing service of that bigger application. And the component type, it automatically gives me a list of, I mean, in technical terms, it gives me a list of possible builder images it could use to build my application. So I say it's a Node.js application, awesome. And then, and then fair enough, we have the option to build multiple versions of Node applications. So I say 10. And then it also asks me on the bottom right, that, do you want to really clone it locally or do you want to just deploy it? I say, I'm fine. I just go ahead with deploying the application, which means, so, so what I'm doing, which printed out here in the logs below is, I'm effectively creating a component. What that effectively does is it checks out your code, it takes a source and creates an image out of it. You didn't have to worry about Docker build, you didn't have to worry about learning what containers do, you didn't have to worry about OCI or anything else. You just gave, gave your source code, you said it's a Node.js source code and it's of version 10 and it did the rest for you. So let's uh, quickly take a look at that namespace and the project in my OpenShift cluster. I can see something got deployed here, and if I click here, I can see that it's a billing service par. It's a billing service par circuit management. Um, so, so it's a billing service inside this application. So which is why it appended the name. It has a pod. Um, it is running a deployment config. If you're familiar with Kubernetes. And if you see the resources, yeah, it has created a service as well in Kubernetes. That's it. Um, so it did a bunch of things for you without you having to really tell Kubernetes explicitly to do all these things. And now I want to try out how my application looks like. So what I'll do is I'll say, I want to, I want a new URL. And then what that effectively does is it goes and creates a route for me. So I'll say, I, I want to call this, you know, customer facing URL so that I know that I, I could possibly have some ports which should be specifically being used internally and not for the customers. So I name it as a customer facing URL. And then right here, I could click here and it'll take me to the deployed application, which I just took from source. I just, all, all I did was I want to deploy the source code. And this is a Node.js project, so you know, and it's version 10. And then it created my deployment config or deployment it, that deployed the pods. It created a service out of it. And then I said, I want to be able to access it using a URL. What it did is it went and created a Kubernetes route for me or an OpenShift route for me. All good, and then now I can repeat the same thing again inside the same application, which is, uh, let's say I, I do the same thing, I deploy another different application here.
and I could keep doing this on and on. Um, let's say this is a grievance service. And again, it's a Node.js application and then I said no I'm not interested in making changes to the code I just want to deploy it so that's what it goes and does it creates everything for me and then I can go in and say hey there is a second application which has showed up here and then I could if I'm a developer who also knows Kubernetes OpenShift but doesn't want to deal with it all day I could use VS Code for deploying things and then go in here and dig deeper as much as I want in the world of Kubernetes so there you go. I, I just demonstrated to you that you could take any source code inside your VS Code ID and deploy it on OpenShift um, without having to leave the comfort of your ID. Um, so, so this is kind of more of the outer loop development, not exactly our outer loop. It's, so, so we have two forms of development. One is inner loop and outer loop. Inner loop is effectively you're making code changes and you want to see, see the changes live in some URL. Outer loop is effectively you're making code commits that you hits your CI solution, tells you your core code is good, and then you choose to deploy it, that becomes your CD. But today we're focusing on the inner loop, which means I have source code, and I want to be able to quickly iterate on top of it. One of the first things that, that I want to do is, I have a nice GitHub project. I want to be able to quickly deploy it on OpenShift from my VS Code and see if it works. So we saw it works, and now what we'll do is we'll, 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 we'll try to wire things up, make some mistakes, and then see how can we come back and get it still running. So let's say we create another application, or let's say we have the grievance service here, which we just deployed. Um, and I think that needed a database. So let's see. We'll see how it goes here. Um, let, let, let me figure out a way to reach the application. Let's say, again, customer-facing route. Yeah, it's a typical, you know, a fruit stock management app application, which I try to, let's, let's add a fruit here called Mango um, 4. And the moment I try to save it, it says, it gives me some weird error. And if I went and dug into the logs of this, so let's say this one. Oh, it said that it had some trouble connecting to... 127.0.1 and then with 5432. So the typical guess would be trying to connect to a PostgreSQL database and it doesn't have one. So, so let's see how a developer would go about fixing this. So let's say I am in my own namespace here. So let's say I just create a fresh namespace where I'll deploy things from the scratch. Um, let me probably go back here and let's say I have my project and I did a git clone. So I have my source code with me now. Um, I enter here, my code looks good. And then as a developer, I would open the code in VS Code. I have it here. I'll quickly look at my OpenShift cluster. Right, I could access OpenShift cluster, which I was using in the other instance of VS Code. And what I do is, let's say I'm in a developer namespace. It's like dev boss, for example. And then I say, hey, I want to create a new application, which is nothing but workspace for my, for my stuff to go in. Then I say, hey, I want a new component. And I'd like to use a workspace directory for that, which means I'm, I'm not going for GitHub URL. I have some source code in my local, and I, I would want to use that. That's hey, it found out the source code which we used. And it's the same thing, let's say, fruit stock manager. And it turned out to be a Node.js thing, and I'd say the type version 10. And so what I'm doing is I'm actually starting with, you know, doing the initial deployment of my app application in a separate workspace, see it fail, and then, then I'll try going, going and fixing it. So 
is taking slightly longer because it's a slightly more complex application than the first one. Meantime, let's visit the namespace which I just created. Um, yeah, I can see things moving here, and then I go to the topology, and I can see something has worked out. Right. So it looks like the application has been deployed almost. In the meantime, I could go and look at what are the different, res different resources associated with it. There is a pod here. Um, yeah, you could see a bunch of things mounted here. This is, this is effectively your VS Code plugin injecting a bunch of things there to actually uh, make it quicker for, for you to write code locally and mount it to a volume on your cluster. And instead of having to really build it, push it to an external registry and then pull it. So that's what it does. Right, it says successfully all changes have been pushed to this component and let me simulate the production issue which we, we just saw and say uh, dev URL and that should go in and create a way for me to access my application which I know doesn't work for now. So I said this and it doesn't work. So what do I do now? So I go in and I realize that I, I, I showed you that it's probably looking for a database to connect to, but it doesn't have one. So, so what I'll do is from within the comfort of my ID, I'm going to quickly deploy a, my, a PostgreSQL database. So go to my workspace, I say new service, and there are a bunch of different service templates. I'll go for a PostgreSQL. Then I'll say this is uh, the fruit DB, just so that we recognize what, what it is. So what it now is doing for you is, it is taking an image of PostgreSQL um, and running it on your cluster and making it available for you to bind to your application. Uh, the next step, what we'll do is bind it, of course, but we'll wait for the PostgreSQL service to come up. Uh, we can, of course, monitor that in our cluster. We could see there's something, there's a PostgreSQL which is showing up here. We could all, again, do some more advanced views. And we can see there's a pod and there's a service that is here. And it says successfully created, which means my database is here, so I can see um, nice visualization here saying that this is a database, it's called FruitDB. But then, fair enough, I have it, but that doesn't solve my problems. I need to ensure that my service can talk to my database. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go, go here and say, I want to link a service. Then it'll say, which one, FruitDB? Because that's the only one you have there. I said, yes. And what it's effectively doing is, it's, creating environment variables in my pod for fruit stock manager so that it can connect to the database. So what, what we'll check is, it says the link service, so it's trying to link it on, on, the, on the bottom right, you can say it's in progress. Uh, so behind the scenes, if you are a Kubernetes nerd, what it's effectively doing is, um, using um, an admission webhook, it is injecting your environment variables into your pod and restarting them. So that next time your pod comes up, the, your, your fruit stock manager, it has all those environment variables injected in them. And yeah, and yeah, to do so, it creates a secret, and then it basically mounts that secret into your container, and that's how you get to get, get your environment variables. But then I would expect stuff to work. Let's say, now it says the binding is done, and I, oops. Yeah, let me just hit the same URL again, and I see still nothing shows up. Yeah, it still doesn't work. Let's go ahead and see what's going wrong here. Here is a pod. 
I could check logs here on my cluster or I could also go in here and say show log and it could show me log right in my VS Code as well. I don't really have to go to the cluster, but then I keep going there. Um, so it tells me similar things that, you know, I, I could, couldn't connect to the database. Now I'm starting to wonder, probably I need some code changes here. I said, awesome, that should not be a problem. So I go to my code, and then I say, hey, this is looking for an environment variable called my database service host. It's looking for DB username, it's looking for DB password, it's, it assumes that the database name is my data, the ton, ton of assumptions the code is making. Now, as a developer, this is where I start iterating on my code and I see changes. So the first thing I'll say is, okay, what were the env env environment variables that got mounted? Because, because they have to match with this. So go to my cluster again. I just quickly do an env, or I do an env grep postgres and see what are the things. Yeah, so I see a bunch of these environment variables have been mounted here. Awesome, so I, sh I should probably make some of my code changes based on that. So it needs a Postgres SQL service host, so I'll probably go and modify this. And yeah, I should be good, because I should be able to read it. Um, let's try it out. Um, so how do I now push my changes there? Um, in a typical world, you would do a Docker build or a build a build push it somewhere and then go in there and ensure your image gets updated into your pod and then you should run it. But what I'll do is, since I'm using the OpenShift connector, I'll quickly go and say push and that's it. It's going to take my code changes and push them into my cluster, get my pod up and running, and I should be able to see those changes in which may or may not work, we'll find out. Um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta all, always go back to your cluster and see things happening in real time. So what this does is, yeah, it says it has, it has successfully pushed my changes to the component. So I would now expect things to be working. Let's see. A bunch of these here. Oops, still doesn't work. I do the same debugging dance again, where I go in here and I say, show me the logs. And it tells me, it doesn't complain about not being able to read the database. So now it's complaining about, I can't read the database, but the authentication doesn't work. So I'm saying, hey, come on. Now what, what I do here is, so yeah, I'll probably again go back to my node and see, hey, you know, what are the environment variables you have given for my username and password? So I say, hey, env, and then it's, let's say if there's something called username, it does look like, yeah, there's something called use, username, and so I'm guessing there would be something like password as well, so. Um, the name of the environment variable is Xbox is username, and the rest is password. And in my connection string, I see there is another place where things can go really wrong, which is the name of the database. Um, let me try to find it. Um, so let's say, let's say I just a name and something should. Oh yeah, it says database name sample DB, which means I I need to read from this environment variable. So I say. Um, probably I'll just do something messy here. I'll just copy paste this, sample db, awesome. It's the stuff you do when you're trying to get your code working, let's say. Awesome, so I made some more changes and then I'll try to again push them instead of doing five, six different steps of get, getting my app application running on OpenShift. Because my, fo my focus is to get my code running, not to become an OpenShift expert as part of this. 
So what this will again do is this will uh, mount the changes into the same container, do a build, and get it running. And the reason it is quicker than usual is that it doesn't actually do a build behind the scenes on your local system. It does not do that. The main reason do, do, the main reason doesn't do that is because that's time consuming, which means if you're using a Docker socket, it has to send it to the Docker socket, build the code, and then you need, you need to push it to a registry, and then that has to pull from the registry, but all that didn't happen, which is why this is quicker. So let's see, we did a bunch of changes, and before getting the scare of whether it's working or not, I'll just quickly see a, do a show log. Yeah, it says database edited, which means things should work this time. Yeah, things still don't work. Yeah, I could again go into my. I could see it uses a username, password. Uh, it has a sample DB. It has a PostgreSQL service host. So yeah, things should work. Let's see. Let's refresh the logs. Um, That looks like there is still a problem with the authentication, so I could go back here and say, hey, come on, what is the password? So I say, this is my password, awesome. So the, us the username looks good, the database host looks good, so probably go into my pod directly. Then let's say Oh, I was hitting a wrong URL. So I hit it and I see my data has now been picked up from the database. And I can interact this as a create, read, update, delete application. So let's say I don't see a mango here. Um, I'm going to just, let's say, 78, because I really love mangoes. And there you go. I could see stuff reflecting on my application. So what we just did is we debugged a Node.js application, which was having a hard time connecting to a database. Uh, we pushed those changes as I was working on inside the ID, and my application is live, and now those problems are gone. And I could see my Node.js application talking to a PostgreSQL database. So what we just did is, in a few minutes, we showed that within your VS Code, you could interact with your OpenShift cluster. You could deploy applications there. You could deploy services from the service catalog, for example, there. And then you could link them together. So that's it from my demo. I'll move back to the slides. Um, so yeah, the, the project is open source. So this is basically a com common combination of two projects. Um, the one is Audio. Which is which is the short form of OpenShift Do, which is also a CLI tool, which means you could use it outside VS Code as well. It's um, it's like draft to an extent, I would say. But the whole point it does is, as a developer who doesn't want to learn OpenShift Kubernetes, you can avoid doing that and still deploy your applications on OpenShift. And we have the OpenShift connector, which effectively helps you connect to OpenShift clusters. And, and underneath, it uses the same open source project. Um, you could go and submit issues if you find them. You could go and contribute them. And you could go and see what our roadmap for the project is. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Or are we good? Yeah, you do that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Manisha. Hi. So as you are updating the configuration of your OpenShift cluster, is it also gathering all those configuration files so that when you need to take this to production, you already have all of that? Yes. Um, okay. So behind the scenes, it used a builder image, which is also production friendly, which means those, I mean, Red Hat provides a bunch of builder images which are validated for and like they're constantly updated, which means 
your builder image itself is secure, and we use the same builder image to deploy here. So which means if tomorrow you need to take the source code to production, you just say, hey, I use a Node.js builder image. Let's just take this, and we can de deploy it. Uh, what we do not have as part of the configuration is here in this de in this demo is we don't really export the configuration of routes and serv services here. Right. The only thing you can take from here is how to build an image and run the same image on production. Okay. So it is gathering all those config yes. YAML files and whatever that is. Um, yeah. I mean, so 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 it's actually not even a YAML file. I would say. I mean, it's. I mean, in a more in a more production-friendly scenario, that's effectively in OpenShift or Kubernetes. It's basically a build config where you say, here's my source code, here's a build image, now go build and deploy this. Okay. So, and that's the same thing we did here as well. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions, or should we call it a day today? Thank you.